When aircraft depart IFR, how do we know they'll be safe to climb out in the clouds without smacking into terrain or obstructions? A careful study is made of airport terminal areas. As stated in the Instrument Procedures Handbook, among other places, if no obstacles penetrate an imaginary line with a 40 to 1 gradient, then a standard departure can be used, 200 feet per nautical mile, with the first turn commencing at 400 feet above the departure end of the runway. If an obstacle does penetrate that line, an obstacle departure procedure might be necessary. Here at Bristol, Tennessee, in the mountains, the Tri-Cities 3 departure is used. This procedure is designed to allow aircraft to navigate to the north and east towards the Glade Spring VOR to avoid the mountains in the area. ODPs are very carefully designed by the FAA using the TERPS process. If you follow the route, restrictions, and minimum climb gradients of an ODP, you're guaranteed the obstacle clearance they provide. At some airports, especially busier tower-controlled airports, it's not practical for spacing reasons to have every aircraft follow the same route on the ODP. Departure controllers assign different vectors to aircraft to maintain safe spacing. Normally, a controller can't assign a radar vector to an aircraft unless they're above the minimum vectoring altitude for their location. This ensures that above a certain altitude, turning an aircraft in any direction will keep it clear of obstructions. But when aircraft need to be vectored right after departure, well below the MDA, how do controllers know that the vector they're assigning is just as safe? Here at Denver Centennial Airport, we have the Rocky Mountains to the west to contend with on departure, but the eastern side of the airport is fairly clear of obstructions. Let's have a look at the Terminal Procedures publication for this region. In the Takeoff Minimum section, this airport lists an obstacle departure procedure. Let's use runway 17 right. If our on-course heading is between 350 degrees clockwise to 162 degrees, we want to only make sure we're meeting the minimum climb gradient for the runway. There's no mountains to contend with in those areas. If we're going west, though, we'll want to follow the ODP along the radial to the Denver VOR until we're at a high enough altitude to continue. This is a pretty busy airport, though, and it's very close to Denver International, so it won't be easy for multiple departures to follow the exact same ODP. ATC will want to assign some random vectors to keep us separate. But if we look at the minimum vectoring altitude for this area, we see that it's 8,000 feet, a few thousand feet above the airport elevation. In order for ATC to provide a vector below the MVA, they'll use what's called a diverse vector area, or DVA. A DVA is defined in the AIM and says that it can provide obstacle clearance on a random vector and can be used in lieu of a published departure procedure like an ODP. The same entry in the Terminal Procedures publication lists the diverse vector area. For our runway, we're given a minimum climb gradient in order to comply. With the diverse vectoring area, ATC assumes responsibility for terrain clearance. But even if we're Part 91 and don't legally have to follow climb gradients, they're going to assume we're at least making this minimum 372 feet per mile, so make sure to read up on these. Some airports don't have DVAs, but controllers will still be able to issue vectors if certain criteria laid out in their operational guidance is met. The standards for protection are a bit lower in these cases than a DVA, and the controllers are more or less eyeballing the departures using knowledge of local terrain. If you're unsure, you can request the ODP on the departure if it's available, and make sure to always meet the minimum climb gradients.